Hey, hey, settle down back there. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's good to be with you today. Um, I am not Leroy. Uh, that's fairly obvious. Leroy actually was in the hospital. I um, wanted to let folks know a little bit about what's going on. He had some issues, he felt some pain in his chest, some shortness of breath. Uh, he's being uh, evaluated and tested. They kept him overnight, which I'm hoping means that they were able to rule out some of the more obvious issues that uh, he could have had. But he's still, they're not quite sure that un, uh, uncertainty... How many of you are dealing with uncertainty at some point in your life? It's, uh, it's not easy. So uh, be praying for Leroy and, and Barb today um, so you get a little extra of me. I'm sorry. But uh, I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm 100 or just listen to these words. It's a short psalm. Uh, just, just hear this. Shout for joy. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Will you bow with me? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you are good to us. Your loving kindness and your forbearance and your patience. What gifts they are. We get distracted, Lord. There are many things in our lives that, that call for our attention. Many idols that we can set up. Things that pull our hearts away from you. Lord, often these things look an awfully lot like us. For these things, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. When we have been less than devoted, when we have been less than single-minded in our focus on you, we ask your forgiveness. But Lord, we know that you are kind and that you are patient, that your goodness goes from generation to generation and we are loved by you. So today, Lord, we want to lift our voices in praise to you. We want to worship you. We want to hear your word, and so we thank you for the opportunity again to be faithful, to be obedient, to be yours. Be with us today in our worship, we pray in the name of Christ, amen. I guess we already did that, didn't we? <laughs> it's Palm Sunday. So you're going to be called upon today. You have to imagine, feel yourself in a different place. You're, walk, you're standing along the road and you've got palm branches and you're, you're waving them over the, this guy coming in on a donkey. Our guy is Jesus, and we're singing praise to him. So everybody stand up, get your palm branches in your mind. You don't have to really go like this. Yeah, just in your mind. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna.
In place of our children's story today, since our children, this is why we were concerned about doing the kids with the palm branches. It's, it's a little, uh, it's spring break. Um, however, I will say, and, and you alluded to this, Peggy, um, it wasn't kids that were waving palm branches back in, the, in that day. It was everybody. And unfortunately, this is what has happened, is that we've kind of farmed that out to our kids, and we sit in the pews and watch them come in and go, oh, that's so sweet, they're so cute. And it's like, no, that was not what was going on. Y'all were standing up, y'all were waving your palm branches, everybody was praising Jesus at that moment, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, the, in the message today. I do want to give you a couple of announcements that, uh, that uh, I was going to do at the beginning of the service, and then I didn't. So I'm going to do it right now, if that's all right. Um, First of all, to let you know about Easter service, we want to make sure that uh, you're aware of the schedule on that. We will not be having an early service um, on Easter Sunday. Uh, you know we didn't have Easter services last year? Oh, that is weird to me. This year we're going to celebrate, and this was something that I remember from, from the message last year, is that we get this chance to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus as if we ourselves are being resurrected from, from whatever it is that we've been under recently. So uh, think, keep that in mind as we do this. 7 o'clock is our, is our uh, sunrise service out at Walters Ferry. The, the directions are on the, the, the bridge, the newsletter that went out. If you, uh, we are not going to take a bus. It's going to take a little bit much for us to get the bus lined up. But if you want to meet here um, at the church, I'll, uh, how long does it take? 45 minutes? So we'll probably try to caravan from here. If you don't know the directions and you're a little concerned about getting there, uh, meet here at the church uh, at about 6.15, uh, and then we'll take, a, we'll take a line of cars out there. Um, otherwise, just meet out there by 7 o'clock. It does take about oh, 5 or 10 minutes to walk to the place, and so if you get there at 7, you will be late. And so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then we'll have our regular Sunday uh, uh, Sunday. Uh, school here, uh, the, the Bible class is at uh, 9.45, and then we'll have an 11 o'clock service um, as well. So that's the schedule coming up for, uh, for our Easter celebration. And wherever you are, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Also want to wish a happy anniversary to Amos and Rosa. So it is, uh, congratulations to you today for that. Um, it's also Dee's birthday, but she's not here. I think that's why she's not here, right? She slipped out so we wouldn't sing it. Oh, you got to go take care of the <laughs> So, uh, but you get that today. Um, we would ordinarily also have uh, Monday, Thursday service, a love feast on Thursday. But uh, this year, considering everything has to be so close in contact with each other. So put it on your calendar for next year, the Thursday before uh, Easter, our uh, love feast here at the church. We want to uh, invite you a year in advance to be planning for that. And we'd love to have you for that because we want to have a celebration of that as well. Uh, when we can do that safely. So I think I got all the announcements out. So let's sing another song. You ready for that? All right, good. Stand and sing Christ Arose. Thank you. 
Lamb of God. He is our Lamb of God. Up from the grave is a fun song and we enjoy it. This is taking us to the reality that Christ is our Lamb. chapter of Mark, and we are going to jump ahead to Mark 11 for a fairly obvious reason, to read the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We'll go back. We're not going to miss anything in Mark. We're just taking a quick moment to move forward. Verse 1 of that 11th chapter begins, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Matt, (laughs) shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. 
You know what I think is the very best part of this passage? The last verse. I know that may be a little bit of a surprise to you. But I really like that last verse. Jesus enters Jerusalem and he goes up to the temple and he looks around. And then because it's late, he heads back to Bethany for bed. I mean, there's, it's, it's so not what the previous verses were leading to, is it? I mean, this is, this is strange. Think of this. Jesus sends his disciples and they get the colt and they bring it to him the one that's never been ridden, and there's all kinds of symbolism and interesting stuff there if you wanted to look at it. And then he goes into the city like a conquering hero. Now this entry is exactly, aside from the, the, the colt part, which is kind of the opposite of the, the mighty war horse that you'd expect a conquering hero to ride, it's, it's exactly though what you'd expect of someone who was ready to take over leadership in the community. when they would be acclaimed as, as Lord and Master of that, of that community. This is, this is dramatic. It's street theater. Uh, there's a lot of drama in this story. It's, this is what would have set Jesus up as that expected Messiah, the, the deliverer, the one who had come to free the people. It's what they all were wanting. It's why they were singing their praises at the time. And so to have Jesus quietly head out to Bethany in the evening time, it seems sort of like an anticlimax. It seems strange, kind of almost a letdown after all of the jubilation and the hosannas from earlier in the day. So why is this my favorite part of the passage? Wouldn't it make more sense for us to embrace and, and bring to the front all of the celebration, all of the, the jubilation, the, the acclaim of Jesus? Shouldn't we see Jesus as the conquering hero, the, the one riding into town to all of the songs of praise from the people? Isn't that how we want to see Jesus? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Jesus is certainly worthy of praise and worship. And as we come closer to realizing the, the, the enormity of the truth here, then praise and worship are really going to be the only option available to us. One day every knee will bow to Jesus. But I think that Mark in this text, and especially in this last verse, I think he gets it just right. I think that what Jesus does here in this 11th verse, it, it proves that Mark knew better than everyone else certainly better than the crowds knew that day, that Jesus was, was not really what they were expecting. Jesus is something more. Now, to understand what the crowds were expecting that day and, and why they were doing what they were doing, you, you have to understand a little bit about their hopes for the Messiah. As Christians, we've kind of taken that title. We've co-opted the, the name Messiah. And to us, it essentially means Jesus. We don't really think of anybody else in those terms. It's sort of become a proper name for, for Jesus for us. For, but for the Jews in the first century, that label, actually the, that what's known as the Second Temple period, the title Messiah, it meant something different. When I say second temple, what we're talking about is a period of time between when the Jews came back from exile... Uh, about 500 years before Jesus to the destruction of that temple, the second temple in the first Jewish-Roman war in, in A.D. 70. So for about you know, almost 600 years here, this is a period of time when the Jews were struggling for legitimacy. They didn't really know who they were. They had lost their sense of identity. This is a time when the northern kingdom disappears, when Judea is destroyed, all the people are taken into captivity. Now, they're allowed to come back to Jerusalem at the beginning of this period. They're allowed to rebuild the temple. But even though they were allowed to do that, they were still under the direct control of the Persians. They weren't free. They weren't independent. The Persians had taken over from the Babylonians. Uh, even though that they'd been allowed to return to their ancestral home, they were still under someone else's direct control. They were vassals, puppets of other empires for most of this period of time. The Babylonians, well, they lost out to the Persians. The Persians took over for them. Then the Persians handed Judea over to the Greeks. And then aside from just a brief period of time in, in between there where you could call them independent just before the birth of Jesus, there was an uninterrupted chain of oppression that ended up with the Romans, culminated in the Romans. And so 
for folks who were all about being the chosen people of God, this being ruled by other people kind of didn't set well with them. They didn't really understand what was going on. It's not what they envisioned. The joy that they felt when they returned to Jerusalem after being released from their exile to rebuild the temple, all of that joy was slowly eroded through time uh, by the oppression of these empires. And that uh, the joy was replaced by hope, which is a good thing, hope that eventually God would set things right. And then by the time of Jesus, you know, all these centuries later, this hope had kind of turned into that gritted teeth kind of hope, the hope that you have because you have to have hope because you got nothing else. Maybe God's going to finally send the Messiah. Now, all of that stubborn hope was directed at this idea that God would save them, that God would redeem them, would, would, would free them from their captivity through the sending of this ancient prophetic figure, the Messiah. That's what they were looking for, the Savior, the Deliverer, the one that would come from the line of David that would reestablish rightful rule, the descendant, directly descending from the very best king that Israel had ever had was needed to sit on the throne, ruling over the children of Israel, which meant that whoever was ruling at the time, whatever empire currently ran the show, would have to be defeated, driven off, done away with. Now, this rightful king would not only exercise political sovereignty over the kingdom of Israel, they would reestablish righteousness as well. They would come in and, and clear out all of the religious compromise that it had formulated in the temple system. And then the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God, would come and re-inhabit the temple. And everything would be right. Everything would be awesome. And that's what they were looking for. That was the hope. And that's what people were expecting of Jesus when he rode into town to these shouts of Hosanna and blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. That's what they had in mind. Now, there's a lot in Mark's account. Mark, in his usual way, is being very brief, only telling us just the bare essentials. There's a whole lot that's left unsaid. It's hard for us maybe to, to reconcile all of this longing, all of this hope, all of this expectant jubilation of the people who finally, finally seem to be getting what they wanted, what they'd been hoping for for centuries. It's hard to reconcile that with this downbeat, this quiet, almost jarring departure from Jesus quietly from the temple back to Bethany. See, where were these crowds? Did they, did they poof, vanish into thin air? Where were all the people, the ones that were spreading their coats in the streets, the ones that are waving the palm branches, and the ones that were shouting about the Messiah? Where did they go? Where were they that evening when Jesus was looking around the temple, seeing what was going on? Now, it's clear that there were a lot of people who were ready to make Jesus their king, ready to set him on the throne. It's something that Jesus had been careful to avoid all throughout his ministry. So where were these folks? Where were these people? When, when they had Jesus right there in their midst, when they were all lining the streets and he was riding into town on this colt, eh, eh, kind of playing the part that they had anticipated that he would play, the coming conquering hero, where did they go? Did Jesus say something that sent them away? Did, did he do something that maybe subverted their expectations? Why didn't they find him a nice place to stay right there in the center of power, right there adjacent to the temple? Why didn't, why didn't they do something that way? Why was he able to make his way out of town so quietly back out to Bethany? Didn't they want him to be king? I suspect that what Mark is doing here is illustrating the fact that Jesus is not what was expected. Why the crowds disappear from the scene, it's not really that important. There could be plenty of reasons, plenty to cause them to question their adoration later on as a day in the days to come. What is important is that Jesus is on a different path than the one that the people were hoping that he would take. Jesus is going a different direction than what they wanted him to do. Jesus, certainly the Messiah, absolutely the Messiah, but he was not what the people envisioned when they thought of the Messiah. You see, they wanted the triumphant king 
They wanted the, the majesty, the one that would ride into town and take the throne and, and drive out the Romans. And what they got was a humble servant who rode into town on a, the, the foal of a donkey who was on his way not to the throne, but to the cross. He was not what they were expecting. And Jesus may not be what we are expecting either. You see, it's that journey to the cross that throws us. Now, even though we know the story, it's like we celebrate it every year at Easter. We know what's going to happen here in a way that those first witnesses wouldn't, wouldn't, would never know. We still bury that story in all of the triumphalism, of, uh, the desire to make Jesus what we want him to be. When we compare what the Jews were expecting from Jesus in that first go-around with what Jesus was actually doing, that's a, that's a shocking difference. It's profound. The, the Jews were expecting a conquering hero again, a, a king in the line of David who would come in and free them from the Roman bondage. What Jesus was doing was heading for a crucifixion at the hands of the very people that, that the Jews wanted to be free from. You couldn't get a more jarring juxtaposition than that. Jesus' death on the cross really is what Paul says it is in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, a, a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. It's not what's expected. It wasn't then. It may not be now. Are we still stumbling over the perceived foolishness of it? Jesus is not trying to trick anybody. That's not the plan. He's not, he's not here to pull a fast one. He's very clear in the way that he lives about what it is that he's doing. And Mark testifies to this. In the witness of Mark, Jesus has been, has been pretty clear about what he's about, what he's, what he's doing. Go back one chapter. If you've got your Bibles open, uh, you know, keep that there. Go to chapter 10. We're going to go through chapter 10 as we do this. And, and you'll see exactly what Jesus was doing. You'll see exactly the kind of Messiah that Jesus intended to be. The beginning of that chapter, what is he doing? He's interpreting and teaching. He's, he's, he's handling the scriptures carefully. There's some Pharisees who want to trip him up on questions about marriage, and he, he confronts them on their legalistic interpretations. Then he goes on, he's broadening the understanding of what it means to be the kingdom of God. You know, they, they were thinking, okay, we got the standard hierarchy, the important people on top, and everybody else kind of falling in line. And he takes that and he turns it completely upside down. He places children, the very lowest, the very least in that culture, right at the center. He's challenging societal norms. The, the expectation about what is, is, is normal in society, particularly in regards to that most precious, that most dear societal norm, our personal wealth. Jesus is saying that our possessions, our wealth, the things that we own, the things that we gather to ourselves, those things aren't necessarily helpful in our attempts to be faithful. In fact, they're often the opposite of that. They get in the way they're a barrier to our faithfulness. And Jesus, next, is very clear about the path he's on. He doesn't speak in parables or riddles. He's explicit. He's on his way to the cross. He's not hiding that fact. And then he challenges one of the most insidious tendencies, one of the most dangerous, corrupting, poisonous things in, in any relationship, you know, particularly the church, that poison of pride, the desire to lord over others. It had infected his disciples, and he had, to, he had to stamp that out. And then at the very end of the chapter, he's subverting expectations yet again. Again, that hierarchy of who gets to be close to Jesus and who has to stay away. He switches that around. The people want Jesus to ignore this blind beggar, this Bartimaeus, attending to these blind folks, these beggars, these, these outcasts. That's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. But Jesus stops everything just for this one downtrodden outcast. Bartimaeus is not too insignificant for Jesus. This is the picture of the Messiah that we get from Mark. Mark paints a, a very clear picture here, and I'm understating it when I say that. It's, it's perfectly clear. Just look at the things that Jesus challenges here in this 10th chapter of Mark. That legalistic control over the rules, the the intoxicating addiction to wealth, 
the corrupting desire for power and authority. These are things that Jesus pushes against and says, not you. You don't do that. In, this, in the account of the children and of Bartimaeus, Jesus, Jesus pushes back on the social hierarchies the, the, that value certain people over other people. And Jesus is the delivering Messiah, the one who comes to deliver, comes to free us from oppression. That is what the Messiah does, but the oppression is not what we think it is. Comes to free us from the bondage that we are in to the social structures that, that prejudice the wealthy and the powerful over the little and the least. Jesus brings those forward who have been pushed to the back and off to the side and says that those folks that are in control, the ones that are seemingly powerful in the eyes of the world, you're going to have to take a back seat to these little ones. Unless you become like these little ones. Unless you give up your wealth, there's no place for you in the kingdom. So, if the expectation is that Jesus maintains the status quo, if the expectation is that Jesus augments already powerful people, if the expectation is that he fulfill all these second temple messianic hopes and dreams, that he would drive out Romans, that he put the Jews back on in control of their destiny, then Jesus is clearly headed in a different direction. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's why there aren't any crowds that night trying to keep Jesus from heading on back out to Bethany. Maybe that's why we don't hear any more acclaim of Jesus. Why the folks who cried out Hosanna that day may have changed their cries to crucify him just a few days later. Regardless of what the crowds were thinking, Jesus was on a different path. Regardless of what they expected, Jesus was going to be consistently faithful to what God has put before him. See, we need a reminder of that every once in a while. That is a, that is a deep truth that we need to get a hold of, that Jesus is always going to choose faithfulness over meeting our expectations. If we want Jesus to fit into our box and we can use Jesus in the way that we want to use him, Jesus is going to subvert that expectation every time. He's always going to go with what God wants him to do, always. And this is an important truth for us to remember because we can be just as guilty of faulty expectations as those Jews were back in that day. That desire for power and control, that desire to put ourselves first, whether it's economically or socially or religiously or whatever, that's still a part of the human condition. That didn't go away 2,000 years ago. It's easy to find ourselves in the story, to see ourselves in those groups that Jesus challenged back in chapter 10, those legalistic Pharisees. Are we immune to legalism? Or the disciples who tried to prevent the children from getting close to Jesus, do we bar access to Christ sometimes? To that rich man who cherished his wealth more than Jesus, are there things that we put in front of God in our worship? The followers who wanted to be first, lording over their sisters and brothers. The, the crowds that tried to block Bartimaeus from, from encountering Jesus. We can be these people. In each of the examples, those with some measure of power tried to augment that power, tried to grasp a little more uh, by being more right about things, by keeping others away so that they wouldn't take, uh, by holding on to what they wanted. And they all wanted Jesus to help them with this power holding and power building project. They wanted Jesus to validate their desires and say, yeah, that seems about right. They wanted Jesus to support their plans. You see, there's a little whisper in their cries of Hosanna, a little hum in the background that says, give us what we want, Jesus. And we're just as likely to have those same expectations today. If we want to see what we should see in this triumphal entry of Jesus, we need to be clear about what Jesus is doing and who Jesus is. And the first thing that we need to understand is Jesus is not a tool for us to use to get what we want. That makes sense, right? 
I didn't know about that. Yeah, I'll buy that. That messianic expectation back in Jesus' time was a political expectation. They wanted the Messiah to be a political leader, first and foremost. They wanted a king on the throne in the line of David, someone that would give them the power and give them the control that they so earnestly desired, that Davidic king that would replace the Romans. See, they wanted to be in charge again. They were tired of other people telling them what to do. And that's exactly the way that Jesus gets used today as a way to gain power, a way to gain influence, often political. Churches have been co-opted for political gain in our country. Christian leaders within those churches have been co-opted for political gain. Why not go ahead and try to co-opt Jesus too? Maybe get Jesus on your side so that you can get what you want. And within churches, within churches, Jesus is used as a tool of domination as the arbiters of biblical interpretation twist Jesus' words to make sure that they get their agenda furthered. Jesus is used again and again as a legitimizing force for all sorts of oppression. You want to go back to the Crusades? Well, that's not in the past. It still happens today. We acclaim Jesus as Lord. We praise Jesus as Lord, but only if Jesus agrees with our plans. Only if Jesus comes along and furthers our agenda and meets our expectations. Yay, Jesus, you're doing what I want you to do. And if Jesus goes another way, if Jesus takes a different path, then we say, well, that's not the Jesus I know. That's not the Jesus I believe in. The Jesus I believe in is going to do what I want him to do. Instead of following Jesus... Wherever Jesus leads, even if it's in a direction that we don't really want to go, we try to get him to follow us. We don't trust his judgment. <laughs> After all, I mean, he's going to the cross. I mean, that doesn't make sense. That's foolishness. It'd be much better if we went this way, Jesus. Why don't you get behind me and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the way. And when we do that, who's in charge? Palm Sunday is a great celebration and it ought to be we need to get our heads straight though about it when the crowds laid down their coats and waved those branches they were at least outwardly acknowledging the sovereignty of jesus i mean this is what you do for kings this is how you recognize the entry of a king into the into your city he's lord and master when when they were doing this the reality though is that they didn't really submit to jesus they didn't submit to his sovereignty they didn't submit to his lordship like we said just as likely that they'd yell crucify him as Hosanna. They were just as ready to reject him as to praise him because he wasn't doing what they wanted. He was not the useful tool that they, that they desired so that they could realize their hopes and dreams. Jesus didn't meet their expectations. And it shows up in what Jesus did very plainly, very clearly. We looked at it in the 10th chapter. But what Jesus does is rooted in who Jesus is. And now we get to the heart of why we praise and why we sing. Who Jesus is leads us to that proper worship and praise. We can cry Hosanna. It's not, it's not crying Hosanna that's the problem. We can cry, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and we can really mean it. Mean it in the way that it's meant. Because Jesus does what he does because of who he is. And Paul says it to the church in Colossae when he writes, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. That's who Jesus is, and that's why we praise him. 
Oh. Praising Jesus is part of some ritual that's supposed to grant some sort of legitimacy to our expectations. As if we could get Jesus on our side if we yell Hosanna loud enough. That's a sure way for us to lose our way. Because our sovereign Lord Jesus is not waiting around to see which way we're going. He's going to go his way. He's going to go the Father's way. And we can either submit to his rightful authority and get in line, or we can get left behind. I want to make this as clear as I possibly can. Those are the only two choices. That's it. Either you submit to see Jesus' authority and you follow faithfully or you get left behind. But when we can do that, through the strength of the Spirit and the grace that God gives us, when we can set aside what we want, when we can set aside our expectations, our futile plans, our corrupted and selfish agendas, and simply follow Jesus, And simply follow Jesus, we enter into such glorious freedom. Oh, the weight, it's lifted. The burden is now light. We feast at this banquet that Jesus has laid before us. We escape our bondage, our slavery to sin and willfulness, that striving and suffering that we bring on ourselves when we finally give it up to Jesus, when we become his and we surrender to his lordship. And then true abundance. All these things that we've been grasping at so desperately throughout our lives. We can, re, we can, we can achieve these things. True abundance. True wealth. A hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. It's a promise to those that give everything to Jesus. And that is deliverance. Brothers and sisters, that is deliverance from all that binds us. True deliverance comes from the true Messiah when we see Jesus as he should be seen, not as how we want him to be seen, not as a way to have our expectations met and our desires fulfilled, but as one who gives all that is good. And that's who I want to follow. I hope you do too. Let's pray. Gracious God, your kindness, your forbearance, and your patience are rich indeed. You call us all to be faithful in our following, to turn from those expectations, that self-fulfillment, that self-seeking desires to give all to you. Lord, we want to recognize your sovereignty, your lordship, manifest so clearly in Christ. Help us not be left behind, but to follow faithfully and to set our expectations aside and to simply embrace your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. stand and sing we will glorify
bow with me once again. Lord, these are your people, your children. You have called them from wherever they were to where you want them to be. We ask that you would empower them, give them strength this week, uh, lift them, encourage them, give them courage to speak boldly when it is appropriate and to hold silent when it is necessary. Above all, Lord, we ask that you would help us to submit our wills to you in all things, to follow you faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may go in peace.